Okay, I think we are ready to go. And just to mention that, uh, as in the previous session, we will leave all questions at the end. Okay, thank you, Cristina. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm Cristina Pizarro. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And I'm going to present a paper about volatility spillover approach, uh, jointly written with Evelyn Chanatasi, Gaitor Ciarreta, and Ainoa Zarraga from the University of the Basque Country. I am so, I'm also assistant associate professor at the University of the Basque Country and also associate researcher at the Basque Center of Climate Change. So if I had to summarize the paper in one single slide, I would say that with this piece of work, we try to assess the level of market integration that uh, currently European electricity markets face. And to do so, we follow a forecast um, error variance decomposition analysis, and I could summarize the results in, in main three findings. The first one is that uh, there is a, we find that the European electricity markets currently are highly uh, integrated with an overall uh, um, spillover, total spillover index higher than 86%. We found differences uh, across markets, more uh, centralized markets versus the peripheral countries, or more integrated markets versus the less integrated markets in terms of volatility spillovers and market integration. Mm -hmm. And finally, we include, uh, included uh, covariances in our model, and we found that if we leave covariances outside the model, the results will be uh, very uh, underestimated. So it's important we highlight the role of including covariances uh, in, in these kind of approaches. So we think that our contribution is very timely right now in this uh, context that we face right now with uh, European market reforms and all the geopolitical uh, instability and all the price spikes that we face. And we think that our results could be interesting for uh, generators and consumers, the, the participants of the, of the electricity markets, but also to policymakers. So the rest of the presentations follows the regular outline, uh, introduction, data, methodology, results, and conclusions. For the sake of simplicity, I will be, be very brief on methodology. I have some backup slides in case uh, someone is interested afterwards during the questions um, time. And I will, be, um, I will explain in more detail the results. So the main motivation behind this piece of work, as I mentioned before, uh, lies on the grounds of market integration, which is related, on the one hand, to physical interconnection of electricity markets, of different markets, regions, countries, and also on the price coupling of these markets. Uh, indeed, a single market can bring several advantages that are well known in economic terms. On the one hand, we can have um, reduction costs uh, for, for, for demand, demand uh, achieved at a minimum cost, also reduces the reduces cost in terms of, uh, of, of, of cloud, also uh, lower cost uh, for the energy system, uh, difference in the supply generation of supply, and also we can include the uh, intermittency of renewable sources uh, more effectively. So, given these conditions, uh, the, the integration of the electricity markets is expected to bring great efficiency gains. And Europe is aware of these uh, efficiency gains, of these advantages, and has been working towards this market integration uh, for a while. In, indeed, the, the, the main um, the, the price coupling of year regions initiative started in, in, in the late 90s, but it was the efficient, the efficient boost came in, in the year 2009 with this uh, algorithm FEMIA that uh, many European markets share and that uh, allows that in many times, the many hours, they can share even the, the same market price. So, in the current context, we have in the, for the 2030 agenda also a new interconnection uh, target of 50% of interconnection ratio for the European member states by the year 2030. And other um, um, important uh, issues in the, in the European agenda uh, for improving the uh, market integration of the European markets, related also to the reducing the volatility of the energy prices, also to reduce the, um, the geopolitical instability and increase the security of supply, and of course, in this net zero agenda, also to increase the role of renewable energy that actually plays an important role, but is expected to continue doing so in the following years to achieve this net zero uh, emission target. 
So in this paper, we have a twofold research question. On the one hand, we ask uh, how do volatility spillovers vary across the different European markets? We are going to analyze nine different markets, uh, both static and dynamic. And then we want to relate these uh, spillovers volatility and these changes in the spillover volatilities to certain events, regulatory events, uh, supply events, uh, demand side events, and also interconnection level. And we have a contribution more empirical, more empirical contribution, because we analyze the European markets uh, from this perspective, trying to assess how shocks in one price, in one market, uh, transfer to other markets. And also a second contribution, more, empiric more methodological, in the sense that we, as, as the, as, uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, there are little or no papers uh, concerning Europe that include the, uh, the analysis of covariances when they deal with volatilities. There are other papers that include the role of variances, but not of covariances, and we will highlight that in the results. Other papers in the past have uh, analyzed uh, price relationships, uh, volatility spillovers, and also market integration using different methodologies. Uh, Granger causality test, um, um, other, uh, other kind of analysis, multivariate gauge models. But one disadvantage of multi gauge models is that they only allow for pairwise comparison, volatility spillover comparison. If we uh, used the, the composition of the forecast error um, uh, value that Dibol and Yilmaz proposed, uh, we can uh, make a more uh, wider analysis and a more flexible analysis, including uh, more, uh, more, more countries and including uh, more flexible and more variable relationships between them. In addition to this, Fengel and, and Gisler, uh, who analyze uh, finance markets, these volatility price analysis are mainly uh, performed for financial and stock markets, but also for electricity markets, both spot and forward. <coughs> Fengel and Gisler found that the role of covariances was very important in financial markets using a multivariate heterogeneous autoregressive model. And Tanatasi Gerol, in the paper of 2022, implemented this model in the Australian electricity market found, and found uh, important um, spillover relations, uh, including these covariances. And we, in this paper, do the same for, for the case of Europe. So the data that we use are provided by ENSOE, the European um, Transmission System Operator, and we use hourly spot electricity prices. We work with returns, but we base on hourly electricity pri spot prices, measures in euros per megawatt hour, and uh, in an almost seven-year period, from January 2015 until October 2021. And we implement eight countries, uh, Germany, France, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, Italy, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and also the North Pole. Why did we select these countries? First thing, because of the data availability. They are all available in NSOE and are freely available. Um, secondly, because we think that they are uh, important for analyzing these uh, price uh, and volatility spillover relationships. For instance, Germany, Italy, France, and Spain all together account for more than 50% of total European generation, electricity generation, I mean, in the spot market. So it's very important to analyze the interrelationship between them and the role that shocks in any of these markets could have in other markets. Belgium and Netherlands are the uh, closest and more important neighbors from France and Germany, large uh, electricity generators in Europe. So these interrelationships also seem uh, deserves attention. Switzerland, because of this occasion, uh, is a very important uh, electricity and interconnection hub in, at the European level, with frontiers with uh, many other European countries and most of the countries that we consider in our sample. Portugal is also uh, an interesting case of study because despite it only provides a 2% of total electricity generation in Europe, is fully or almost fully interconnected with Spain, showing the same price more than 95% of the hours. So it's very interesting to see how a uh, so well interconnected, integrated market uh, behaves with the other markets in, in Europe. And finally, we included the North Pool because it works differently. It works in, in zonal nodes rather than by country. And it's, in, in, in the, it's another uh, peripheric, peripheral market related to Central Europe. Europe and it's also interconnected, very well interconnected to, to Europe. 
So in this first table, we present the descriptive statistics of the electricity prices, uh, and we observe that uh, the highest electricity price um, corresponds to the peripheral countries. Italy exhibits the highest electricity price on average for the total sample, and also Spain and Portugal. And the largest the standard deviation corresponds to Belgium, but the peripheral countries also exhibit large values compared to other countries. The minimum price, on the other hand, corresponds to Germany. In terms of uh, skewness and kurtosis, we observe a positive, um, uh, yeah, uh, positive, positive skewness and, and excess kurtosis, meaning that the electricity prices are not normally distributed. If we observe the evolution of electricity prices and time in this uh, seven-year period, we observe that prices are more or less stable. We, Natalia already showed a picture like this before. We don't cover the last, uh, the 22 and 20 years, 23 years. Uh, uh, so we are not observe uh, this um, last part of the sample that Natalia was showing before with high prices, higher prices. But we observe that at the end of our sample in the year 2021, prices started to, to peak sharply for all the markets. We also observe positive and negative price spikes related to different events. For instance, the, the most uh, highlighted events, uh, for instance, this high price spike in the year 2016 corresponds to France and sometimes Belgium and are related to nuclear outages. So the model that we use, very briefly, so we apply the Dibul and Yield math methodology for the forecast error uh, by variance, variance decomposition. And we include also covariances. So we work with realized variances and covariances following uh, Fengel and Gisler. And we actually do is that we compute uh, the total spillover index, TCI, and then we work with uh, net spillovers and also to and from countries spillovers to try to measure these uh, volatilities that are transferred from one market to another. In other words, what we do is measuring the percentage of shocks that one country faces and that are transferred to other countries in terms of electricity prices, volatility of electricity prices. Mm -hmm. We divide our results in six slides. The first three are the, the, devoted to the static analysis and the last three to the dynamic analysis. In this static analysis, we work with a forecast horizon of one day. And in the dynamic analysis, our forecast horizon <coughs> is one year rolling window. And what we observe in this matrix is we represent these uh, spillovers, these pairwise uh, directional spillovers for the full sample, and the diagonal elements represent the uh, spillover volatilities that are transfers to one market from shocks in the same market. And as expected, uh, it shows the highest values. The off-diagonal elements represent the cross values. The, for instance, let's take this 4.765 uh, element that relates Germany and France. This indicates that 44.75% 44, uh, uh, of the uh, spillovers that Germany faces comes from shocks uh, that have been occurring in France. <coughs> and this is the same for the other elements. In this matrix, for the sake of simplicity, we only present variances. But in the full paper, we have all, also the uh, much larger matrix with covariances. But this from column and this two row in the end represent the total spillover, uh, considering both variances and covariances for each market. For instance, this first value, 85.7%, represents the total uh, volatility transmissions to, uh, that Germany faces from shocks in any other market both with variances and covariances. What happens if we ignore covariances, as we are doing in this table? If we just sum the value of France, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and the North Pole, all the values except the own one, this value will reach 20%, less than 20%. And the total spillover effect that we actually are computing, including also covariances, is 85%. So we will be underestimating the results. If we measure the average the total spillover index for this sample is um, on more or less 86%, meaning that more than 86% uh, of, uh, of the total uh, one-day forecast error variance comes from these volatility uh, spillovers of, of volatility shocks for other markets. In this table, we describe the net directional spillovers. So what we are actually doing is just subtracting in the previous table the Ooh, sorry, here, the two row from the from column to see each country which kind of spillovers face. 
And we have here a positive value means that the country <coughs> is a net exporter, or net exporter of spillover, a net contributor. A negative value means that the country is a net importer, a net receiver of volatility spillovers. And the values close to zero means that the two and the front columns offset each other. So we observe that France is a net contributor to spillovers in, in the Europe, at the European level, mm -hmm. considering these nine markets. And Italy is a net receiver. And when we incorporate the covariances in the matrix, we observe that the largest value are faced by countries uh, that are net importers and that are interconnected with large, gener generation, um, 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 con large generating countries, such as Germany or France, biggest, the biggest countries. Okay, if we divide these uh, spillovers in, in the components, we observe that the most part of it, 67.5%, comes from the own covariance spillovers, followed by the cross uh, covariance spillovers. So again, the role of covariance is pretty important. And the less uh, role, 5%, comes from the own variance spillover. Moving to the dynamic analysis, with a one-year rolling window, as I mentioned before, we see that the static and dynamic results are consistent. We, we see the same picture. In this case, here in the picture, we represent the total TCI, the total spillover index, and also the contribution of each part. Again, we observe that the largest part of this total spillover index comes from the own covariance, and the less part comes from the own variance, here in black. And we observe, again, in line with the static analysis, that the TCE in the index ranges from here 82% until 90%, uh, uh, with an average value, again, of uh, almost 87%. And it's pretty stable. We observe here a key, and we are going to talk about this later on, but it's pretty stable and pretty high because in the whole sample that we are analyzing from the year 2015 onwards, the interconnection level at the European level is, is really uh, pretty high. So, the policy analysis, not exactly, not of all of these events are policy related, but they induce policy analysis and they induce policy intervention. So we classified some of the um, spikes and some of the variations that we observe in our TCI evolution into demand side factors, supply side factors, regulatory factors, and also interconnections. We cannot say a thing about the COVID crisis because the TCI was already so high that we didn't observe that the COVID crisis led to more volatility transmissions than other events in the, uh, in the markets involved. On the supply side, on the other hand, we observed important uh, um, uh, events affecting the, the TCI evolution. Indeed, in the last part of the sample, the TCI is, TCI is growing, and this could be related also with the fact that we have more renewable uh, generation in the last part of the sample, and it involves a, um, a higher transmission of volatilities due to the intermittency. We also observe that this TCI is high in the last part of the sample related to the changes in prices in natural gas and CO2 that sh increased sharply in the last part of the sample. And we also observe that the launch of the intraday continuous market in Europe in the year 2018 led to an increase in the TCI index and led to a small kink in this uh, series that we are presenting and the interconnections level that were already high. Last result, if we present the individual results by country, we observe that uh, clearly Italy here is a net receiver. It's always below the zero line a net receiver of volatility spillovers from other markets. And France, in general, is a net receiver, as we saw in the previous table. We observe a very interesting uh, behavior between Spain here and Portugal here, because they face the same shape. They are fully integrated markets. The other markets, uh, Germany, France, other markets are part of the IPEX market, but this is a market that is not so, so high integrated as the OMI, as the MIBEL market with Spain and Portugal. Indeed, in the IPEX market, price, uh, uh, the countries uh, involved in the market face the same price, only 35 to, to, to 45% of the hours, whereas in the MIBEL, as I mentioned before, is more than 95% of the hours. And another interesting fact is that at the end of the sample, in the year 2021, when electricity prices became uh, much higher than before, not, uh, France became a net importer. For, and when France became a net importer, the neighboring countries, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, well, Belgium and Switzerland, became net exporters. 
So, all in all, we analyzed the volatility spillovers across nine European markets from a seven-year period, <laughs> and we found that the European electricity market is highly integrated right now, currently, with a total uh, spillover index of 86%, meaning that volatility shocks transfer from one mother market to another market. And we found and highlight the important role of covariances, not to underestimate the results. Other uh, studies in, in Europe have uh, also computed these volatility spillovers and found that the TCI ranges 40% uh, so, uh, without including covariances. And uh, we think we also found that um, regulatory uh, factors and shocks and, 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 and the role of, of the energy transition with increasing intermittent renewable approach will also be important for this volatility transmission. So we think that these results could be interesting also for policymaking. So thank you very much. Now we have the presentation by David Andres Cereso. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay, so thank you very much for accepting uh, my paper. I am uh, David Jesus, Andres Cerezo, that's why it says DJ here, but I'm sorry, there's no... There's no electronic music session. Instead, I'm going to be talking about um, renewable energies and storage, friends or foes, which is a uh, young work with Natalia. And I think I do not need to motivate the, um, the paper a lot for this audience, as we all know that um, decarbonizing the power sector requires uh, massive investments in renewable sources of energy. But we also know that, such as wind and solar, but we also know that these sources uh, have a problem, which is that they are not always available. They are intermittent and volatile. Therefore, in, in current and future electricity markets, we need solutions to shift uh, supply from periods when renewable production is relatively abundant to those when it is relatively scarce. And of course, this is where when storage technologies, especially batteries, come in, as they can facilitate this integration of renewables in the power sector, and they may also bring other potential benefits to electricity markets. So um, our main goal in this paper, given this motivation, is to analyze how can we encourage the deployment of both uh, renewable and storage technologies in electricity markets. And of course, this involves uh, many dimensions, but one that we think it is particularly important is to analyze whether uh, investments in one of these two technologies incentivize or not investments in the other. So whether these two technologies are complements or substitutes from the point of, from the point of view of investors. In principle, if we think about it, uh, conventional wisdom suggests that they are complements, right? On the one hand, we have that storage um, will smooth the renewable production over time and may also increase the profitability of renewables by avoiding uh, energy waste at times of excess renewable production. And also, uh, on the other direction, we have that introducing more renewables into the market, given that they have uh, very low marginal cost and given that their availability uh, differs from one period to another. This is likely to amplify price differences across periods, which will create uh, arbitrage opportunities for uh, storage investors for batteries to make um, arbitrage profits. Well, is that it? Is this always the case? And so we have observed that uh, some recent empirical papers uh, show that um, uh, in some cases introducing storage reduces the profitability of renewables. And also we are not observing a lot of investment in storage despite the fact that there is a rapid expansion of renewables in electricity markets, and despite the fact that the capital cost of batteries has uh, sharply declined in the past decade. So in this presentation, I will try to convince you that it is not always the case that these two technologies are complements, and that this has um, very important implications for current policy and regulatory debates regarding what are the best um, policies in order to promote investments in these two technologies. And what we will see is that popular policies, such as mandates or investment subsidies, of course, are useful, but they are not equally useful for every market and at every stage of the energy transition. So in the paper, we approach this in two ways. So first, we, we develop a stylized theory model of, uh, of uh, electricity markets, of operation and investment, which is useful to, uh, to, to rationalize ambiguous empirical, um, ambiguous empirical results in the literature and also to identify the theoretical conditions under which, which these two technologies are complements, and also to analyze how long-run capacity investment is affected by different uh, policies or support schemes. 
And then I'm going to use, the, if I have time, the results of this uh, theory model in order to interpret uh, uh, some simulations that we run for the Spanish electricity market uh, under different uh, scenarios regarding the amount of renewables that we have in the market and the amount of batteries or other storage, storage technologies. So I start directly with the theory model. It's a very simple model in which uh, consumer's demand is price inelastic and moves in, in deterministic cycles. And we use a sim function, which is not very common, but uh, it is useful to analyze uh, demand cycles in a simple way. We have renewable technologies in the models that have a zero marginal cost of production up to available capacity omega KR. So KR is the amount of uh, solar farms and windmills that we have in the market, and omega T is the fraction of them that, are, uh, that is available at a given point in time. And this uh, availability factor, omega T, also moves in cycles. And depending on the value of the parameter alpha there, we can have two um, ideal or extreme cases. Uh, when alpha equals one, we have a renewable production that moves procyclically with respect to demand. And when it is equal to minus one, we have that it moves countercyclically. So this is a, you can think of this as a typical daily cycle. Demand uh, is lower during the night, uh, relatively high during the day. And depending on alpha, we can have renewables that are countercyclical or procyclical with respect to demand. This is a strong simplification, but we can think that uh, procyclical renewables uh, capture uh, solar farms because renewable production is usually higher when demand is also higher, solar production. And for uh, countercyclical renewables, we can think of them as wind, although this is a bit uh, more ambiguous uh, because usually wind is higher during the night. For other components of the, of the electricity mix, we have that thermal generation has a linear marginal cost of production. And uh, storage firms can charge and discharge their batteries up to uh, storage capacity KS. In the presentation today, uh, all firms behave competitively. They are all price takers. And regarding the timing, there is an investment stage in which firms decide uh, whether to renewable and storage firms decide whether to enter the market or not. And then there is a, an operation uh, stage in which firms in a day ahead market decide uh, when and how much to, to charge and discharge their batteries and to produce. So first, it is useful to analyze what happens in the absence of storage. And in the, given our simple assumptions about uh, competitive behavior and linear marginal cost, we have that in these models, uh, prices are just given by consumer's demand. Once we subtract uh, renewable production, which, which has a zero marginal cost, so prices are given by net load. And renewables affect prices in two ways. The first term here is that, uh, shows that uh, more renewable capacity depresses the price in, in every hour of the day. But the second term shows that this occurs uh, relatively more in some periods than in others. So the, the volatility of prices is also affected by renewables. And what it is important for the story I'm going to tell is how um, renewable production is correlated with prices. And we can distinguish um, three cases. When renewables are countercyclical, here we have demand uh, in, in, in black and prices are in red. One is demand once we subtract renewable production. So in this case, we can see that renewable production and prices are, are always, are always uh, negatively correlated, and increasing uh, renewable capacity from K to K prime amplifies price differences across periods. When renewables are, are procyclical, we have that uh, two different cases, depending on how many solar farms we have in the market. At early stages, when we do not have uh, still many, we have that prices and, and renewable production uh, are positively correlated. And introducing more renewable capacity is going to flatten price differences across periods. But uh, uh, if we keep increasing uh, the amount of renewable capacity, we reach a point at which the correlation between prices and renewables becomes negative. And after that point, uh, further increases in capacity uh, amplify price differences across periods. Um, the problem of storage firms is simple. It's just to choose when and how much to charge QB and discharge the batteries, QS, uh, to maximize arbitrage profits, taking prices as given and subject to capacity constraints. And the solution to this problem graphically is very simple. is to buy when prices are low, to sell when prices are high in a particular way, which consists in flattening prices during the periods in which storage firms are buying and during the periods in which they are selling. So we are already in a position to define what do we mean precisely by complements or substitutes. And basically, we say that um, these two technologies are complements if the profits of one technology increase when we uh, increase the capacity of the other technology, and if this works in both directions. And they are substitutes if the opposite occurs. So our first result uh, basically says that 
these two technologies are going to be substitutes in one of the three cases that I have presented, which is, uh, in particular, the one in which uh, renewables are um, uh, renewables are procyclical and the amount of renewable production is small. So, uh, whether they are complements or substitutes depends on one uh, fundamental of the model, which is the correlation between prices and uh, or net demand and renewable production. When this correlation is negative, we have that they are complements and otherwise they are substitutes. We can see this with the graphs a bit more clearly. So here we have the same graph as before with procyclical renewables, but still a low amount of capacity. If we start with this storage capacity, so you can think, you can think of this as a solar dominated market. Uh, storage firms charge during the night and, and discharge during the day. If we increase the storage capacity from this area to this area, this is going to push up prices during the night and down during the day, which is precisely when renewable firms are selling most of the energy. So in this case, uh, introducing a storage is going to hurt uh, renewable producers. It's a case of positive correlation. It works also in the other direction. If we increase the amount of renewable capacity, we are going to have that this depresses prices in every hour of the day, but relatively more in the periods in which storage firms are selling their energy. So the profits of storage firms go down in response to this increase in renewable capacity. However, after we cross that point, if we substantially increase solar capacity, um, this reverses the correlation and it makes the storage operators change their behavior. They start to charge during the day and to sell during the night. And as a result of this, uh, an increase in storage capacity is going to push up prices precisely when renewable firms are selling their energy and similar in the other direction. Oh, okay. If we increase renewable capacity, this is uh, benefiting uh, storage firms because they are charging at a lower price. So when we, what are the implications of this for long-run investment in these two types of capacity and for different types of policies? So if we consider, for instance, that a regulator or a policymaker wants to to promote investment in the two by, by introducing investment subsidies, ETA, for these two technologies. We have that introducing a, an investment subsidy for one technology increases the amount of that technology, but uh, depending on whether the correlation is positive or negative, is going to increase or decrease the amount of the other technology in the market. So in the case in which renewables are procyclical and we still don't have a lot of them in the market, subsidizing or mandating one technology is going to act as a barrier for the other technology. In the, in the other case, there is a positive feedback loop. Feedback loop. Uh, increasing, subsidizing one technology comes with the additional benefit of promoting the other. What are the implications of this for the optimal combination and, and timing of, of investment subsidies? Basically, we have that in, in, in these uh, solar dominated markets, or, or markets with procyclical renewables, it is always suboptimal to subsidize storage at the beginning because this is uh, working at, at cross purposes with uh, renewable subsidies. Instead, we should uh, have an exogenous push in renewable production so that we reach this critical mass of, of renewable capacity at which the correlation between prices and production is reversed. And after that point, it is optimal to subsidize both. Just before going to the, uh, to the results of the simulation, I just want to mention what happens when, so far we only have either pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical renewables, what happens when we have both, which in principle is great because negatively correlated availabilities are, are, are good. But in this case, what we find is that introducing a storage in the market is going to necessarily crowd out one of the two technologies, one of the two renewable technologies, and in particular, the one that it is relatively scarce, which is the one that will be uh, positively correlated with prices. So in most markets, it is good to have uh, three technologies, but only two of them will become dominant. Then we, uh, use, um, uh, we simulate a similar model for the Spanish electricity market, but with details on prices, plants characteristics, renewable availability, um, uh, price of, of fossil fuels, and so on. And we consider different scenarios. For renewables, we consider the market as it was in 2019, and the market as it is, going, as it is planned to be in terms of renewable capacity in 2030. And for each of these two scenarios, we consider storage capacities that go from 4 gigawatts per hour to 40 gigawatts per hour. So here you can see that the increase in solar capacity is very substantial between the two scenarios and the increase in wind capacity is also substantial, but not as much. So these are the graphs that are basically show the, 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 the empirical counterpart of the, of the theory model. Here we have the low renewables scenario with uh, solar production, average solar production concentrated in the intermediate hour of, hours of the day, wind production and prices. We can see that solar is slightly positively correlated with prices and wind is slightly negatively correlated. And on the right, we have that uh, a negative value means that the storage firms are charging the batteries and a positive one means that they are discharging them for different values of capacity. 
This is the same graph in 2030, and here we, ha we can see that the large increase in solar capacity implies a large increase in solar production in the intermediate hours of the day, and as a result, uh, price differences increase uh, uh, among, between different hours of the day as compared to the previous case. So this implies that the storage uh, firms uh, shift, uh, switch their behavior, they start to charge during the day instead of during the night. And as a result of this, maybe you cannot see it, but here the, the scale is, uh, this is uh, multiplied by, by a factor of 10. So this uh, uh, expansion of renewable capacity amplifies price differences across periods and increases uh, storage utilization and storage profits. It is interesting to show that in the 2000, oh, Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> in the 2000, so here we have different amounts of storage capacity. And here we have the capture price for its technology, solar, wind, storage when buying and storage when selling. So we have that uh, in the 2019 scenario, adding storage into the market does not affect the profits of, uh, of renewables. But in the 2030 scenario, introducing more storage uh, slightly increases by around 10% the profits of uh, solar uh, producers and decreases around uh, by around 7% the profits of wind producers. So this relates to our previous result. Technologies that are positively uh, negatively correlated with, um, with prices uh, are benefited by storage, whereas those that are positively, cor uh, positively correlated are, um, uh, are hurt by storage. So just to conclude, um, uh, we have seen that um, uh, renewable and storage capacity investments do not always complement each other, although they do it in many cases. But in some cases, when net load and renewable production are positively correlated, this is not the case. This implies that uh, investment subsidies or mandates or other policies must be tailored to the characteristics of each market, such as their demand patterns or their solar potential, solar potential and in particular, in solar-dominated markets, we should expect that uh, we should have before a big initial push to renewables before starting to subsidize storage. And finally, um, just mentioned that renewables with uh, negatively correlated avail availabilities are, are useful, of course, because when one is not available, it is the other. But in this case, introducing storage is not going, is, is not going to do uh, a lot of good because uh, one of them is going to be crowded out by storage or vice versa, introducing renewable generation, uh, a renewable technology in a market with another renewable technology in storage is going to crowd out storage. And I finish here. Thanks. Next presentation is Carlotta Masciandaro from University of Groningen. Thank you. Awesome. So thanks a lot uh, for having me here. I will be discussing a joint project with my supervisors, Michaela Kessina and Makio Mulder, on carbon leakage and how to mitigate it, especially looking at the um, EU emission trading scheme and how the state aid for indirect emission costs affects firm prof profits. I will go through some brief introduction and then discuss the economic model we use, how we empirically evaluated it, and then the results we have so far and the conclusions. So, uh, first of all, how does, how does uh, uh, the EU emission trading scheme contribute to carbon leakage? What is the carbon leakage within the EU ETS? So the idea is that the EU ETS, as probably all of you know, imposes uh, to firms in certain sector not to emit more than a given number of allowances. This, of course, create a direct emission cost for these firms. However, also uh, fossil fuel power plants are subject to these uh, requirements, and they can pass this emission cost uh, through the electricity price onto electricity users. This creates an indirect emission cost for electricity intensive firms. And this is the part that I focus on in this project. The idea is that these electricity intensive firms located within the EU uh, may lose competitiveness and hence are at risk of carbon leakage because of this indirect cost. 
And this, of course, can have negative effects both for the domestic economy and for the global emissions. And this is a, a very well-researched topic. Uh, what the EU has um, decided to do to mitigate this risk is to allow countries to grant a type of state aid, the state aid for indirect emission costs to these electricity intensive firms. Uh, however, these member states are free to decide whether or not to, uh, not to grant it, and they also are allowed to change the amount of aid they grant based on certain characteristics and guidelines. In theory, a country should choose to grant this aid if its electricity price is strongly affected by the uh, carbon price. When does this happen? This, is, this occurs, of course, if we have a lot of uh, fossil fuel power plants as price setting power plants in the market. Uh, what is the issue, though? As has been shown for a lot of other support policies for firms, often these policies generate windfall profits. And this is usually because there is asymmetric information. So, of course, the government doesn't know as much about the firm's uh, cost structure than the firm does, as well as trend-seeking behavior and regulatory capture. Uh, our intuition was that this could be also the case for this type of state aid, and this is what I look at. So if windfall profits are a problem for this state aid, this would imply a misallocation of the public funds, and this could also reduce the um, incentives that these electricity intensive firms have to um, adopt greener processes. Since uh, no previous study has uh, looked at whether this type of aid was um, too generous, we really tried to fill this gap. So my main research question is how does the state aid for indirect emission costs affects for profits? And we look at both whether this policy has been effective in reducing carbon leakage but also if firms have obtained windfall profits from it. The idea is that we first model and estimate the effects of the indirect emission costs on the firms, on the firm's profits. Then we look at the uh, effects of the aid on profit, and then we can determine whether firms have obtained too much aid, so they have uh, obtained windfall profits from this policy. Uh, we use a simple uh, economic model where basically we assume that the firm's um, uh, profits depend on their uh, capital labor as well as the electricity as an input. And the idea is that a firm that is located within the EU will face a higher electricity price and this higher, uh, the magnitude of the, this increase is due to the, how strongly the carbon price affects the electricity price in that country. And the idea is that with the aid, uh, if the aid is of the optimal magnitude, it will uh, counteract this effect, such that the electricity price will then uh, return to be equal between the two countries. Of course, under the assumption that the two uh, electricity prices would be equal. Uh, having said this uh, simple model, will derive three um, conditions for this type of aid. Firstly, when is aid needed? Aid is needed if the firm um, is located in a country that has actually indirect uh, emission costs. So if the electricity price in that country is negatively affected by the carbon price, and if the firm is negatively affected then by that increase. The aid is effective if it increases the firm's profits, and there are no windfall profits if the aid is of that optimal magnitude. Here in the, in the last part, we could also think of a, a, a less than uh, rather than just the equal, but then that would not provide enough incentives. So that's why the equal is there. So it, in the end, it does not generate windfall profit if the indirect emission cost had no net impact on the firm's profits. How do we estimate this? We use the following regression model when we look at the uh, EBIT as a measure of firm's profit. And, um, and uh, we look at the effect of aid, electricity price, and control for turnover and the number of employees, as well as having um, year fixed effect and uh, country and industry fixed effects. The idea is that our parameter beta one uh, represent whether the aid is effective. So if this parameter is positive, we will find that the aid has been effective. Uh, regarding whether, um, regarding the effect of um, 
uh, the, whether there are windfall profit generated. This depends also on the magnitude. So we first look at uh, the effect of the aid on profits and multiply that by the amount of aid that the firm will receive. And then compare that with the, uh, our parameter B2 from the previous equation, so for the electricity price. Uh, multiply by that change of electricity price in that country due to the UETS, which we compute also ourselves. But I will not go through that because of time constraint. And the idea indeed is that if these two um, values are the same, we can assume that the firm did not receive any windfall profits. What data do we use? We rely mostly on Orbis, and we have about 8,000 firms in 17 EU countries uh, between 2014 and 2019. And this state aid policy has been in place since 2013, actually, so it's uh, quite a decent sample. Moving on to the results. What do we find? Firstly, we do find a positive uh, effect uh, for aid on uh, uh, profits. So for about 1,000 euros of uh, increase in aid, we find that the firm profits increased by 200 euros. So we can consider the aid to have been effective in mitigating carbon leakage. But what is most interesting is the um, windfall profits part. So what, we, uh, what I'm showing in this graph is the effect on the indirect emission cost on profits. And we see that indeed uh, all firms in the sample do have uh, a negative effect of indirect emission costs. And when we compare that to the size of the increase uh, in profits thanks to the aid, we do find that there is uh, quite a high likelihood for about 22% um, of firms in our sample to have received uh, windfall profits. Um, I say just the likelihood because we cannot uh, be 100% sure because we had to estimate um, uh, for some firms how much aid they had. And we, are, we believe that this might be an underestimation. So probably these effects are actually stronger. So overall we see that about, there is a very large um, variance across countries. And we do see that for a lot of countries that we consider um, there are um, a win for profits being obtained. This then implies about 15% uh, of the aid granted by countries to be basically devolved into win for profits. Um, to conclude, what do we find? We find that aid is, has been effective in reducing the risk of carbon leakage. However, we find that 22% of the beneficiaries of this aid may have uh, obtained windfall profits. We also observe large cross-country differences in windfall profits, and this, of course, could be very interesting to be further analyzed. Moreover, we uh, also test whether the windfall profits occur even if um, under the rules set by the EU, and we check for every country, are, are each country following this type of rules? or are they going overboard? And actually all the countries are respecting the EU rules on how much aid to grant. So this suggests that maybe these rules should be tightened. And for instance, the aid expenditure should be um, decreasing as the uh, share of EU auction uh, revenues. So the more uh, countries earn from their uh, EU allowances revenues, um, the less as a share, they should invest in the aid. Uh, lastly, a big problem with this type of aid is the transparency on the firm uh, that are receiving it and how much they are receiving it. So one of the main policy implications of this study would be to uh, implement transparency obligations so that we would be able to reduce the information asymmetry and also incentivize the external scrutiny that should um, reduce the regulatory capture uh, that may be at the core of these windfall profits. And uh, thank you. That was my presentation. So our final presentation for this session is by Anas Damun of the University of the Basque Country.
Uh, hello, everybody. So uh, my name is Anas Damoun. I am a PhD student at the University of the Basque Country. And today I will present to you a working, uh, uh, working paper of ours, which is titled uh, Restructured Moroccan Electricity Market and its Interactions with the Iberian Power Market. This is a joint work with the market providers, Aeta Sierra and Mary Paz Espinosa. So uh, I'd like to start by basically summarizing what the, pa the paper does. And uh, what it does is basically simulating a hypothetical uh, functioning of the currently existing interconnection between the Moroccan market and the Iberian market, where the counterfactual assumes that the Moroccan market is liberalized, at least it's a generation of GPG, which is not the case in the real world. And consequently, we assume that the interconnection capacity is allocated through market coupling. Okay? And why do we do this? Uh, for a set of reasons. First, uh, this uh, hypothetical scenario is quite plausible in the future. Uh, first, the liberalization of the Moroccan market is highly plausible, uh, since the country is currently one of the most liberalized, uh, has one of the most liberalized electricity markets in Africa. And, uh, thank you. And about 75% uh, of the generation in the country comes from pr the private sector. The distribution sector is also, uh, to some extent, liberalized. And basically, the next logical step for further uh, liberalization efforts within the country would be to establish a wholesale market. Uh, likewise, as I stated, uh, the Moroccan market and the Iberian market have been interconnected since uh, 1997. And the capacity was extended in 2006. And there are uh, two other expected interconnection lines to be commissioned, one by 2026 with uh, Spain of an additional 700 megawatt capacity. And another one with Portugal uh, by the year 2030 uh, with 1,000 megawatt of capacity. That would bring the nominal capacity uh, between these two markets to a substantial 3,000 megawatts, which is uh, somewhat higher than the current interconnection capacity, for example, between Spain and France. So this will be an important, uh, this, will have, this will have important implications for both markets, and we are trying to anticipate this. And uh, finally, this is the currently the only existing interconnection between the African grid and the European grid. And uh, due to the heterogeneities across these two regions, uh, it is quite interesting to analyze how this affects uh, the outcomes uh, of uh, the benefits from this interconnection. More, concre more concretely, uh, what we will be simulating is uh, different scenarios of interconnection capacity going from the isolated case, where we assume that these markets are not interconnected at all, uh, going to, uh, passing through the current capacity case, where we simulate the currently existing interconnection capacity, and then uh, two other scenarios that are only simulated for uh, the horizon year 2030, where we capture the new interconnection line that should be commissioned in 2026, which, is, uh, called, which we call incremental capacity one scenario, uh, the next scenario, incremental capacity two, captures the other line with Portugal uh, to be commissioned by 2030. And finally, uh, a final scenario where we, we, co we consider that there are no transmission constraints across the markets. And uh, we will be looking at prices and their behavior, congestion and congestion rents. And uh, more importantly, we will look at uh, the social welfare that is generated by the current interconnection and also uh, by extending its capacity. We combine all these scenarios with three, with three uh, different years. The first one uh, is 2019, which we consider as a regular market conditions. Uh, at least there were stable fuel prices and more or less uh, stable uh, emission costs. Uh, the year 2021, uh, which, we which was a crisis year, that is where we had uh, unstable fuel prices and uh, more, uh, most importantly, soaring fuel, fuel prices and also for uh, emission costs. And the final year, which is 2030, uh, which is a horizon year towards which the supply, uh, the supply profiles and demand profiles of both markets' uh, objectives are, are formulated, and also towards which the objective of the interconnection capacity is formulated. Uh, a brief presentation of the market. So as I said, the Moroccan market is currently uh, regulated. In our simulation, we assume that it is liberalized and that it operates similarly to European markets, that is, as a uniform price auction operating on hourly basis. Uh, for the Iberian market, we simulate it in its actual stage, uh, which is double-sided uniform price auction, and also uh, it operates in hourly basis. Uh, in this part, I just highlight the complementarity between these markets, as the literature states that when markets are complementary, the social welfare that is generated by interconnection is quite high. 
the scales of both markets are not uh, similar. The Iberian market is actually 10 times larger than the Moroccan one, but you can uh, clearly notice the complementarity when it comes to the demand profiles, where demand in the Iberian market peaks in winter months uh, due to, to the need for heating, whereas demand in Morocco peaks in summer. And uh, when there is such complementarity, the markets can, uh, can complement each other and uh, maximize uh, welfare. Same thing when it comes to, social, to the social supply profiles. The main price setting technology in the Iberian market is the combined cycle uh, units, that is, it relies on natural gas. Whereas in Morocco, the main price setting technology is coal fired, coal fired technology. And uh, again, we have heterogeneity when it comes to price setting technology, so we have uh, some sort of complementarity. And now for the methodology. So uh, the simulation of the year 2030, I included it in the methodology because it was an ex-ante simulation and we, have, we had to construct the supply and demand profiles of, uh, of the included markets. For the Iberian market, we relied on the national uh, energy and climate plans of both Portugal and uh, of Spain to generate their demand and supply profiles. For Morocco, we relied on a set of different uh, data, such as published tenders, renewable targets, and so on. Uh, note, however, that for the 2030 simulation, uh, it is based on uh, the meteorological meteor patterns of the year 2030 and of the demand uh, patterns and so on. Basically, we are trying to capture also some uh, regular market conditions in that simulation. Uh, that means that we are simulating a single possible re realization for the year 2030, but one realization that can then be uh, compared with at least the simulation from the year 2030. This is the supply profile in the year 2030, but in summary, we just have a much higher uh, renewable capacity in both markets, okay? Okay, now for the market coupling. So first, what is market coupling? And as I said, it is just one way to allocate the existing interconnection capacity between uh, two electricity markets, uh, which is, uh, this allocation can be done either explicitly through explicit options or implicitly. And market coupling is an implicit way of doing it. Basically, uh, it tries to dispatch electricity across in both markets in a way that social welfare is maximized uh, over uh, both sides of the border. Okay? Uh, the methodology we use is based on net export curve and is similar to the one that was uh, developed and, uh, and implemented in the first market coupling in Western and Central Europe, which was between France, uh, Belgium, and Dutch. And basically the methodology, uh, based on the submitted hourly bids by market participants, uh, aggregate supply and demand curves are generated. And then at each price level, the difference between aggregate supply and aggregate uh, demand gives us a value that represents either the net export curve or the net import curve. Basically it captures the willingness to import and the willingness uh, to export of, uh, of the interconnection markets. And the social optimal uh, equilibrium happens at the dispatch, the dispatch point where the willingness to import and the willingness to export of these markets are equal, okay? And uh, the capacity, uh, ex the existing capacity between these two markets is implicitly allocated. However, such, such a dispatch is not uh, necessarily feasible, okay? So when we have enough uh, available transfer capacity, that is, the transmission constraints are not binding, then such uh, dispatch is feasible, and the markets, the prices in both markets converge into a unique price. And uh, in that case, the welfare, uh, the potential welfare that can be captured from trading electricity between two markets is totally captured, so we don't have any congestion, uh, congestion costs. However, when transmission constraints are binding, such as uh, the case to the right, then the convergence of prices is not possible, and we will have only uh, partial convergence. We still have different prices across the border, and this obviously gives rise uh, to rents, uh, which are called congestion rents, okay? We also have a congestion cost that is represented by a potential uh, social welfare that could have been captured if the interconnection capacity was higher, but uh, it was not due to the uh, capacity constraints. Okay, so now for the results. Uh, I start by summarizing the average annual prices per megawatt hour uh, for each scenario and for each year. Uh, first, in summary, prices in the Iberian market are much lower than prices in the Moroccan market throughout the scenarios and in all the simulated years, which is as expected as 
Uh, in the Iberian market, there is a much larger uh, renewable capacity with its marriage order effect. And also, uh, there is an excess of supply, at least compared to Morocco, where the supply is barely adequate. Okay? And uh, for the year 2021, prices were higher in general uh, for both markets. This was due to the energy crunch, obviously. However, uh, in the year 2030, uh, we noticed that prices in Mibel fall by about half, as I said, because demand stagnates uh, across this time horizon, whereas capacity keeps expanding, and specifically renewable capacity. Uh, on the other hand, in the Moroccan side of the border, uh, despite in, in, in incremental massive capacity in renewable, prices actually rise. They do not fall. This is largely because uh, this new capacity is offset by uh, an increase in demand in the Moroccan market. And uh, with higher interconnection capacity, prices gradually converge till they, re they reach unique price. And uh, in summary, prices slightly increase in the Iberian market, whereas they uh, sharply decrease in the Moroccan uh, market. Uh, this graph highlights the monthly average prices by scenario and in both markets. This is mainly just to highlight that th when we move from the baseline scenario, which is the isolated case, to the current capacity scenario in the year 2019, uh, prices quickly converge despite a limited interconnection capacity of 900 megawatts in that case. And uh, we can notice that converse prices that are represented by the red curve are largely set by the Iberian market, which is uh, normal as it is the, the larger market in, this, uh, in the dynamics. Uh, for the year 2021, more or less the same conclusions. However, in that case, we have higher prices, uh, mainly starting from June, where the air energy crunch more or less took off. And uh, in, that, in the year 2021, the isolated price gap between the two markets was uh, much more significant, which means that prices did not uh, converge that much uh, once we move to the current capacity scenario. We have another peculiar, peculiarity as well, is that this is the first time where the prices in the Moroccan side of the border were lower than prices in the Iberian market, and this was mainly explained by the fact that the prices of international uh, coal peaked in October and then they fell sharply whereas uh, prices of uh, natural gas uh, uh, kept peaking in, in November and in December. Uh, similarly, with, uh, for emissions, uh, for emissions, uh, ETS emissions. Uh, for 2030, we have more or less the same conclusions. Uh, this graph highlights the aggregate trade between the two markets. Uh, in orange, we have Spanish exports, which is uh, the dominating variable in this uh, interconnection. However, uh, we noted that in the year 2019, at least, when we had uh, regular market conditions and stable fuel prices, uh, the dynamics of the interconnection were mostly set by demand si side patterns. That is, uh, we had Moroccan exports in the winter months when demand was peaking in uh, the Iberian market. Okay? However, in the year 2021, what we had is that uh, the dynamics of the interconnection were largely set by uh, supply side factors. Okay? As I explained, Morocco ended up exporting in November and December when coal-fired prices were uh, falling while natural gas prices were still soaring. Uh, the same conclusions for the year 2030, except that with higher interconnection capacity, uh, we have higher exports from Spain to Morocco, whereas the imports, Spanish imports do not benefit that much. Okay, uh, now for congestion and congestion rents. Uh, in orange, we have uh, the direction from Spain to Morocco, and you can notice that it is largely congested, uh, contrary to the direction from Morocco to Spain. So we can say that uh, it should have priority when it comes to investment. And uh, congestion was naturally higher in the year 2021 due to a larger price gap across the borders. In the year 2030, uh, we, ha we have submitted more scenarios for the year 2030. So if the current capacity is maintained all the way up to the year 2030, and uh, in our hypothetical scenario, the congestion levels will be huge, almost 7,000 hours, again, dominated from the Spain to Morocco direction. However, if the targeted interconnection capacity is reached, which is around 3,000 megawatts by the year 2030, then congestion falls to some reasonable level, which is around uh, 3,000 uh, hours. Finally, uh, for social welfare, uh, we analyze uh, for the year 2019, with a baseline scenario, uh, as, uh, with the isolated case as a baseline scenario, we have that the current interconnection level generated about 138 million euros in uh, social welfare. 
And when we move uh, from the, the current capacity scenario to a theoretical unlimited capacity scenario, only an additional 43 million euros of social welfare were generated, which kind of highlights that uh, once uh, the costs of interconnection are, are factored in, this, could be, this would have been not really viable in the year 2019, and the capacity in 2019 was more or less appropriate. However, the, conclusion, the conclusions changed in the year 2021. In that case, again, mainly due to the larger price gap uh, across the markets, we had a much larger uh, social welfare that was generated by the interconnection. In that case, about 280 million euros of, inter of uh, social welfare. Uh, about 178 million of it were, came from congestion rents. Okay? And when we move from the current capacity, again, to an unlimited, unlimited capacity scenario, an additional 162 million euros of uh, social welfare was, was generated. So it would have been worthwhile to have a higher capacity in the year 2021. For the year 2030, uh, again, we have more or less similar conclusions. Uh, all these scenarios are compared with the baseline of the isolated case. Uh, that assumes that there is no interconnection between the markets. And in that case, uh, the current level of interconnection capacity would have generated 368 uh, million or, or 86 million of uh, social welfare for both markets, uh, and out of which 268 million would have been uh, in congestion rents. Notice also that uh, the main beneficiaries are uh, Spanish generators and Moroccan consumers, so Spanish consumers do not benefit that much. How, uh, however, congestion rents are also substantial and are generally split across both markets. Uh, finally, when we move from the incremental capacity to, to the to, uh, non-limited capacity scenario for the year 2030, again, only a very small amount of uh, social welfare is generated, which highlights that if the targeted uh, interconnection capacity is reached by 2030, it would be appropriate in uh, regular market conditions. And uh, that's it. So to conclude, uh, our results indicate substantial welfare generated by the current existing interconnection between Morocco and uh, the Iberian market, and further benefits that could be captured by extending its capacity. We have also that welfare gains uh, uh, are largely explained by the cross-border price differentials, uh, in the isolated case at least, and also that the results from social welfare analysis cannot necessarily be generalized uh, over several years, as is generally done in the literature. We have seen that market conditions do affect the conclusions. And finally, uh, unlike some old forecasts and projects, such as Desert Tech, that were, uh, that were foreseeing a uh, flow of electricity from North Africa to Europe, our conclusions highlight that the adverse would happen, at least uh, towards the horizon uh, 2030. And uh, thank you for our attention. Thank you to our speakers for very interesting contributions and for good timekeeping in aggregate. As the lunch is going to take a few more minutes than originally planned, we have time for a few questions. So if there are any questions, I think first we have Natalia, then Mike, and then the first two rows to start with. Thank you. Really fascinating on very relevant topics. So let me start from the end. I think this analysis is highly valuable. I had one doubt and one comment. The doubt refers to the um, um, emissions reductions and the benefit of those emission reductions, whether you take them into account in your welfare analysis, and in particular, how would it work? Because as I understand it now, the uh, power market in Morocco is not, sub is not subject to carbon pricing, whereas the Mibel market is. So how does it really work in your analysis? How do you integrate carbon pricing into the Moroccan facilities? The second is more of a suggestion. I think that what you're looking at is, is very relevant, but it's very short term. Because we know that we, when we integrate markets, uh, um, there's long-run effects, for instance, on investments. Uh, there is a, a very nice paper by Marbury Wont and Gothers on the interconnection of the northern and southern part of the Chilean market. And they show how that interconnection was instrumental in fostering more solar adoption in the, in the north, which is where they have the solar resource. 
in this case, I understand that the interconnection would foster more solar investments in Morocco, which would uh, further compound the welfare implications of the interconnection. I think this uh, follow-up would be extremely interesting to look at. Regarding the paper, Carlota, right? Yeah, very interesting as well. I was, I have to read it in detail. I think it's extremely relevant. I also had some ideas in mind. Um, I would like to see more of a heterogeneity in the firms that, um, are for which uh, they really get a windfall. Is it the firms that are exposed to more international competition? Are they not? And, uh, and this increase in profits, uh, where is it coming from? Is it a pure state aid effect? Or is it that, I don't know, maybe they're investing in, in emission reduction technologies or en energy efficiency, so we are getting an increase in profits for the good reason, not for the bad reason. Thank you. So sh should we get the first three set of questions and then we'll, we'll get uh, um, answers? So this is a question for David. Um, I, I don't know whether you've thought at all about the issue of uncertainty and how that affects your model. In particular, I'm thinking about uncertainty and the effects on storage. Uh, in terms of the pricing, given that it's, that, that it's uh, using arbitrage. But I think it also affects potentially um, the, the renewables uncertainty in the pricing, depending on what, what sort of contracts they have. Yeah, I, I got a question for Christina and another one for David. Yeah, the, my question for Christina is that okay, may, maybe it's my fault, but I miss the, the the way in which you estimate exactly that uh, that uh, spillovers. Okay, so I, I guess you have some uh, structural model behind. Okay, but uh, then my question is that uh, uh, you have to be careful because this big uh, big break taking place during the pandemic. Okay, may, maybe it's uh, bias in your estimation, and I, I and I, I suggest you to to as a robustness analysis just to to estimate. Uh, with the sample previous to the pandemic and after the, the pandemic to see if the the result that there is no, nothing by particular after the pandemic pandemics still holds uh, and and my second question for you also is that uh, okay when you when, when you obtain the the covariances in, in, in the volatility prices uh, i guess if you take in, if you take into account the the fact that the countries uh, can receive uh, asymmetric shocks okay so, and, and, and because that shocks are uh, by nature unpredicted, so the, 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 the policy uh, implications of uh, that correlations driven by shocks, asymmetric shocks, or driven by only other, other, other causes uh, are important. Right? And, and for David, okay, as I understand, you, uh, you consider two, two technologies, one, one uh, uh, two for renewable, renewable uh, energy, one is procyclical and the other one is contracyclical. Okay, and as I understand, they are always, forever, procyclical or contracyclical, right? So, but this is uh, difficult uh, to assume in real life, okay? Because uh, things are not so, okay? And moreover, they, the, the, the procyclicality or uh, countercyclicality can be driven by uh, policies itself, okay? So, depending on the policy, for instance, it's not the same uh, subsidy on energy uh, or, or pricing uh, fuels, the, the, the implication they have on the procyclicality and, uh, of, the, of, the, of the energy uh, changes, okay? Do we want to go along the, the table? Maybe starting with Anas, who's received the first question, coming over to Christina. So uh, to answer the first one uh, regarding the emissions, uh, indeed you are right, like in Morocco there is no uh, market or no taxes on uh, emissions, on carbon emissions. Uh, in our simulation, like when we simulated the Morocco market, we actually relied on uh, similar power plants that were operating in Europe to generate the bidding behavior of uh, the Moroccan power plants. Uh, because there was no market and we had, of course, to construct a bidding set, a set of uh, bids. And uh, what we did at that point was we eliminated the effect of, uh, of the UETS on the bidding price 
of uh, these European, uh, European power plants and before simulation the Morocco match. However, uh, we are currently in the process of simulation uh, NASHCOM where we do consider at least a certain level of uh, carbon taxes uh, that is established in Morocco, uh, largely because uh, the, with the upcoming uh, border tax, border carbon tax that, sh that will be implemented in Europe. So we think this will make our results more realistic and uh, this is what we are currently doing. And uh, this is for the first question. For the second question regarding the long run effects, uh, you are right, speci specifically the, uh, about its, uh, the impacts on investments and how this changes the dynamics. However, in the way uh, to which we have simulated the market, it is uh, quite difficult to integrate these long run effects because we are uh, using a market simulation approach, uh, relying on you know, millions of bids for every hour. This is why we try to kind of simulate three different years that captures three different market conditions rather than extend the analysis over a large set of, uh, of, uh, of years. But uh, we will look into it if it is possible for sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the, for the comment, Natalia. Yeah, um, we did try to consider a bit the heterogeneity of the firms, but indeed we could look more into it to look exactly what are the, their differences. We look more we, across sectors, and that's why in the end we use the uh, sector year fixed effect. But we didn't look within the sector that much, so that could be a nice, uh, nice extension. And for the, the increase in profit, we did try with some um, robustness check to see, like, uh, econometrically whether we could, like, sort of uh, identify that that was the aid uh, effect. So. We are relatively confident, but I see your point that there are there could be certain strategies that uh, make the aid more useful for firms to invest in uh, green processes. So our idea was more like it should foster this kind of uptake up until the point that is sort of too generous over the indirect emission costs. But I think that's really about the um, political um, objective of, of the aid itself as well it's not to increase the uptake of this technology, but rather to um, mitigate the effect of the indirect emission costs. So I think maybe that's also related. But I will look more into it because it's very interesting. And thank you. Okay, so I start with the first uh, question regarding uncertainty. So in the model, we do not have uh, uncertainty. And that's, uh, that's an important uh, uh, characteristic of, uh, of renewable investment, but uh, if you look at the data in general, it can be seen that the predictable variation in renewable production is much more important quantitatively than the unpredictable one. What would be the effect of uncertainty still, if it, even if it is second order, it is, it is still important, and of course uncertainty is a force towards complementarity in both cases. We would still have uh, some degree of substitutability in the case of substitution, and this uh, the presence of uncertainty would increase the option value of storage and is a force towards complementarity, but um, uh, we will still have the other part, which in principle quantitatively is more important. Regarding the procyclicality, countercyclicality, well, the, the, the production of um, uh, renewable production is exogenous, but of course, whether um, and policy cannot affect that a lot. To, to, or not directly. Of course, whether something is procyclical or countercyclical with respect to demand, even if renewable production is fixed, it also depends on how demand moves and on, you can affect that. Um, uh, it can be, become demand is endogenous and with policy you can change that, but at some point uh, uh, each technology is going to have some degree of procyclicality and countercyclicality. And, uh, and uh, I, I, uh, we would expect something Something, uh, something similar to these results. <laughs> no, but still. I see your point. Okay, now Natalie is helping me. Uh, so basically, what, what I, what, uh, but still, well, uh, whether uh, the, the, key, uh, uh, the key fundamental of the model or, or the key parameter that drives the result is not correlation between demand and renewable production, it's between demand net of renewables and production. So you are always going to have some degree, of, uh, you are going to have either negative correlation or positive correlation between the two. Which technology is pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical is going to depend on 
the demand pattern that is going to differ over time and across markets, but what really matters for this result is the, the net demand. Okay, uh, thank you, Javier, for your very valuable suggestions and comments. First of all, you didn't miss a thing. I didn't talk about how we estimate the model. And uh, what we actually did is we estimated a multivariate heterogeneous autoregressive model based on the variance and covariance uh, realized matrix. And we use a lasso estimator for, for doing so, because we have so many parameters. And uh, you're right, uh, this is a nice suggestion. We will probably do, do this as a robustness check to, to split the sample in some subsamples and see if the TCI results hold. And also concerning the uh, asymmetric shocks, you're also right, I agree with you. There are models that uh, extensions of the, this model of uh, Diebel and Gilmath and Fengel and Whistler that uses also this that analysis, this asymmetric part. We didn't do this in this paper because including covariances already complicated interpretation of the results very much. With variances, it's very easy to interpret. With covariances, things get more complicated. But I think that uh, we, we should do it in an extension too because it can capture more, more important and relevant information in terms of, of volatility spillovers and relationships between markets. So thank you so much. Is it best to stop here? Do you have space? Yeah, we'll stop here and then give you the opportunity to ask, to ask further questions during the lunch break. But Join me in thanking our speakers and our contributors. <laughs> <laughs>